And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And, oh boy, is this ever, the butterflies are out. We're starting to see painted ladies. I saw my first swallowtails, which swallowtail is that great big yellow uh, butterfly with the long tails. It's actually our state butterfly for the state of Arizona. Painted ladies are are not as known. They're, they're smaller and they're orange in color with black stripes and stuff. So anyway, that they're, they come out and they're kind of the first ones and then swallowtails come out and then monarchs and then all of the others. It is, we're on the migratory pattern here in the mountains of Arizona. And so we start to see hummingbirds, uh, the, the migration of birds of all types. You will absolutely be amazed at the varieties. So we counted uh, or identified birds here for a while. And there we found over 96 varieties of birds right here at the garden center. And so there's a, there's a lot going on. You can find that many or more. Right now I've got uh, mallard ducks. Oh my gosh. What the heck are those crazy ducks doing in my backyard? They're enjoying the pond. It's not that big. They're just there enjoying it. It's hilarious. But when you start to hear uh, ducks out in the landscape, you're kind of going, now what the heck is that? I'm not, now I'm overlooking Watson Lake. I'm just over the hill from Willow Lake. And so I mean, Prescott, Arizona is noted as the city of five lakes. And so we do have a lot of, of waterfowl here, but not in your backyard. And so I think that's also part of the reason we are on that migratory pattern. They're coming north to south, south to north, and they are using the waterways. And so they're using the Verde River and they kind of pop up over here and they're looking at the lakes and they keep going further north. And it's just, we're, we're a, it's, this is a paradise. I mean, this is God's country up here in the central highlands of, of Arizona. Just the mountains are stunning and the birds know it. And so they are using that. So you can attract a lot of different wildlife in your backyard and butterflies are a natural. And so right now you can start planting. We just had our first uh, order of milkweed come in or uh, Asclepia. Is that what the, yes, I think that's the Latin name for milkweed. Butterflies love that. Monarchs are famous for it, but all butterflies like milkweed. They also like alyssum. They like candy tough. Candy tough is a beautiful perennial. It's blooming white right now throughout the North Country. So this is a wild uh, perennial that just grows out there in nature. So animals don't eat it. So javelina, deer, rabbits. But butterflies and hummingbirds know what it is and go, this is a nutritional source. I can, I can rest here for a moment and then keep flying. And so it's a, it's a natural for them. Butterfly bush. Uh, that's a, that's, it says butterfly bush. It actually does attract butterflies. Lilacs though, actually attract even as many or more pollinators to it because it blooms early on when, you know, butterfly bush is more of a summer bloomer. The other name for that is summer lilac. So it usually blooms right after the lilacs do. And so, but the lilacs are the first. That's a great source. Uh, uh, I think uh, your herbs like lavender, rosemary, great, great pollinator for plants. They attract butterflies and bees. The bees are really hungry right now because they have been in hibernation since October, really. So that's a long time for them to hibernate. And so they're coming out with a ferocious appetite and the queen is needy. So they're going out foraging, trying to find anything they can find in bloom right now. Right now, a number one for them manzanita. They just know what it is. And so they go and pollinate the manzanita, which is in full. You'll see a nice evergreen with red bark. It's got these uh, tiny, kind of like double, bigger than BBs, but uh, smaller than marbles. Okay, that's hard to just, okay, over the airwaves. I wish I could show you those, but it's a bell-shaped flower, hundreds of them on this evergreen bush. And you'll see bees and butterflies all over that. So I think we can attract more wildlife into our landscape. Even if you're in an apartment, you could easily set a container of, of, of pinstamins. Hummingbirds are going to be all over that. They cannot resist their native pinstamin. This is a wild 
a flower, grows up about knee high. It's not quite in bloom up here yet. It's in full bloom down in Wickenburg. Lisa and I went down there last weekend and it's, it's in bloom down there. And the hummingbirds were fighting over those flowers. They just loved it. And, so, and they'll do the same thing. You don't have to put a hummingbird feeder in your yard to attract hummingbirds. They're naturally going to come because we're on the migratory pattern. We're naturally here along with all of the other birds. What's really fun, we had a, uh, the owls are back. And so we've got a pair of horned owls that just hang out in the backyard and they're hooting up a storm. It's just, that's a beautiful sound. Okay, so so mallard ducks are kind of like wank wank wank. That's not in my world a beautiful sound, but to hear an owl just whispering, talking out in in the back gardens, and I'm sure they're overlooking the ponds like the ducks are and waiting for a meal to crawl by. So so they are keeping my voles, my rats, and chipmunks down. That's good. So you don't want to be that in my backyard because there are, uh, we've got some uh, some hawks, kestrels uh, that are also kind of hanging out around. So if your yard becomes active enough, it starts to feed on itself. They start to attract more and more. And what it takes is you need cover for birds. They got to feel safe. You need a place to roost. They want to feel either hang out. Right now, I've got uh, a quail in my lavender. So it's a nice, big, thick lavender. And there's a quail's nest in there. And every time I go up and down the stairs where that lavender is, she freaks out. It's just kind of, she, you know, they kind of spook you. And you almost have a heart attack when they fly out of the nest. Of course, she's trying to get you to look away from the nest and look over here. Look at me. Follow me. So it's just fun to watch that. And then I'll get to have a quail family running around the yard. It's just, it's just a delight. That's part of the joy. So part of our gardens at our own, at the Lane Casa, we are gardening for us. Uh, we've got edible gardens, beautiful gardens. I'm a flower gardener myself. I want beautiful flowers. I like fragrance. So we just had our first scented geraniums come in, just beautiful scented fragrance where people can walk by it. It fills the, the patio up with this wonderful smell. But then the lower half of the gardens are for the birds. As so we, we plant extra blackberries, I have an extra grape just for them. I've got rosemary, trailing rosemary, across the dry creek bed just for the pollinators. I've got salvias uh, and uh, uh, blue mist spirea over there just for the birds. They're beautiful, but it's for me and it's for for them. You can have your cake and eat it too. We are Americans, the greatest country that's ever lived. We can have, we can have our cake and, and frost it and the whole thing all at once. And it, 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 we can have that and enjoy life. Watch a sunset. I mean, it's a beautiful place. Like they were saying, I just read it in, uh, I think it was the Washington Post on Sunday. They said that uh, people enjoy sunsets and sunrises more than they even enjoy a symphony. They've got science on this stuff. This is crazy. So it's just like we enjoy this more than a beautiful painting. So that's just nature's beauty. And we are in the heart of it, is are we not? It's just beautiful. I could finally be out in the front yard and read the paper on the front yard uh, uh, sofa chairs outside in my, in my jammies. So if you see someone like with messy hair and looks like they just got out of bed, well, okay, that's me. So just enjoying the fresh air and the butterflies and the hummingbirds are out there floating around. Uh, they just like that. And so I noticed my little finches and stuff. They're coming into the pavers and they're picking the sand. I've got silicon sand in, in between the pavers to lock them in place. They're, those doggone birds are just ants antics watching them. They're picking up the sand. They're right at my feet, pecking around, looking for. I'm sure they're using that for digestion or whatever they do, whatever birds do with sand. <laughs> they're enjoying my front yard to do it more with. So gosh, spring is a delight. I love it. Uh, a lot of the first of the flowers are going in. My peonies are about to bloom. Oh, there's a lot going on. Anyway, you can attract butterflies to your yard. Got a lot in store for you. We're going to take a break here. Have Lisa Waters laying in with your garden questions right after this. And back, we have Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. What are your neighbors talking about 
And can we glean some information or helpful, get, see where people are going? So already, oh, welcome, Lisa. Glad you're here. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Good to be back. Scale, scale, scale. People Ooh, are in for yeah. scale. Pinion Pine scales in. So we're the tidal wave. So when 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 a, when a epidemic happens, it just doesn't happen to your tree. It goes to everyone's tree all at the same time. So mm -hmm. Pinion Pine scale are out in force. We're telling folks. They're bad. Deal with them. <laughs> Definitely. Especially on those pinion. I mean, sometimes you buy the properties because you want the beautiful trees. And my goodness, keep them healthy. Yep. A little bit of Gardner TLC mm -hmm. goes a long ways. Mm -hmm. You can turn sick plants around mm -hmm. just like you can. Puppy dogs, children, neighbors. You can turn <laughs> them around just with a little bit of TLC. So give them some food. Well, we're saying collect all those egg cake because you're seeing this cottony mass with some yellow goopy stuff in the middle of it. It's kind of gross. Pick that stuff up. It's not goopy, but it's Icky. ugly looking. <laughs> Pick it up, throw it away, get it off your property, mm -hmm. and then treat that tree because you can't get all the egg casings. It's impossible. And they attack a tree by the thousands, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so treat it with tree and shrub drench. So mm -hmm. collect, fertilize drench and you know that that tree should have new growth that is fabulous you do that for a couple of years you have a luxurious tropical looking native pine tree out there just because you took an interest in the natives so anyway it's a time means everything oh, so Definitely. one application of the drench good for the year mm -hmm. so you, you don't have to be an arborist you could do this yourself it's not that expensive so anyway, it's easy to do. It so, actually yeah. is super easy to, to yep. mix and to use. So there's no reason not to. Uh, definitely worthwhile to protect those trees. I've done all of ours here and I did the ponderosa pines. So mm -hmm. I've got some aphids. You're seeing some <laughs> dripping getting down on the car. Mm -hmm. So that aphids are up at the top and they're we call it aphid poo or dew or excrement. It's excrement. Yeah, whatever. It's <laughs> gross. Spitting down on you as you're eating lunch. That's not right. So you put down and again, fertilize. Put down the the the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, tree and shrub drench. It goes up the tree about a foot a day, and eventually gets up there. It taints the tree from the inside out. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like an antibiotic or vaccine. It's, not, it's like an antibiotic <laughs> for trees. It really does right. work. Great preventative. Oh too. yeah, tremendous. Yep. So should we get to questions? We should. Or I think so. Just... Let's try to stump the gardeners. Here we go. <laughs> oh, you're unstumpable. I'll make something up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Unstoppable. You, you would make up the answer. <laughs> yeah, and sound convincing. Not really. I just go, I don't know. That's a stupid question. Moving on. Next. Okay. <laughs> not really. Well, Shannon and Chino <laughs> would like to know. Um, she did not get to prune her peaches and apples. She wants to know, is it too late? Do you just wait at this point? Or do you go ahead and prune? So, okay. So <laughs> apples and pears, you're probably okay. If it's not in bloom, Get on it. Get, don't stop dilly dallying. It's time. The sap is flowing though. So mm -hmm. that's the challenge. So the reason we do it earlier is the sap is slow. And so the plants start, you don't have as many bugs that are going to come in, uh, you know, disease things that can happen. So if you're making a cut on anything bigger than, let's say, a pencil or, or, or maybe, maybe a, something a little bit larger. Seal it. We've got a, a, a pruning sealer here. It's a little black mm -hmm. spray, aerosol spray. Just kind of prune it, zip it, kind of seal it off to keep the bugs and disease off. And you should be fine. So if it's in full bloom, already has got fruit on it, I'd say wait. You've waited this long. Wait. And then in the summer, after you've picked all the fruit, yeah, summer pruning. Shape it. And then uh, really prune on it next <clears throat> year. Prune on it heavier next year, but yeah, yeah I'm going to say you can prune it. Is it ideal? No, it sounds like you want to do it anyway. So go for it, but get a can of that pruning sealer. It's very inexpensive. It will keep you from having headaches Literally. down the road. Yeah. Okay. Next question. No more pruning questions from this point forward. You should have it all done. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Question after that. No, <laughs> So Janice in Prescott Valley uh, wants to know how deep do the raised beds need to be for growing herbs and veggies? Okay. And part two to her question, is it better to use a soaker hose in those beds or to use an irrigation like sprinkler head? Oh, gotcha. Good question, Janice. Great questions. So if you read the book or, or you search anything, it says eight inches. 
or one block or one is, is enough to grow plants. And that's true. It is enough. But is it ideal? If you're if you're building a raised bed, she was in Prescott Valley. Is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. If you're in Prescott Valley, that hard clay soil, you're going to be gardening this bed for years. Set it up for years of enjoyment, not just this year's enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So I find that eight is not quite big enough, deep enough for your deeper root crops, uh, uh, carrots, tomatoes, potatoes. They all need more. Asparagus, rhubarb need more. So I would say go 16, just double down. So get it a little bit deeper. That is plenty of soil to be able to, to grow in. Now, what to grow in, that's the biggest challenge. So you go off to your rock yard and they've all got a garden mix, which is terrible stuff. They're getting, they're digging out stock tanks. They get some free horse manure out in Chino Valley or Williamson Valley. And then they add some wood chips they get from the city and they blend it all together. And they call that a garden mix. That is not a garden mix. It does drain, but it doesn't grow very much. So I'd say fill it up with some of that stuff. Maybe get top, but the top layer where you're growing in, you should have a real mix. And I, I would say use water's potting soil. If you're if you're growing, if you're you're buying plants from us, that's what our plants are grown in. Our grower developed that years ago. And if you can take a plant that's already started and put it into more soil that it's always known, you'll have 100% uptake. It's gonna just gonna thrive and do well. And I wouldn't blend that potting soil with a, with that junk down below. I would just top it, use that as filler, put the rest of that last six, eight inches, four, six inches, something like that, with just straight potting soil. Start plugging your plants and away you go. Uh, that's kind of kind of how you go. Now to your irrigation question. Great question. Soaker is better than spray. Because many times when you're spraying, especially as we get into the monsoon season, the, the foliage can stay too wet for too long, and you get spotting mildew, verdinton, ver, ver, uh, <laughs> It's easy for you to say. Tomato wilt. I'll just call it tomato wilt. <laughs> Vertinillum wilt. Vertinilla wilt. So <laughs> curling to the foliage, and there's no recovery. You just got to throw that plant away, and it's usually midsummer when that happens. It hurts you. Yeah. It's starting to put fruit on. Yeah. But if you do soaker hoses, the, the, the ground stays moist, but the foliage stays dry. That is absolutely ideal. The other one, more importantly, though, for everyone is when do you water? When do you turn the irrigation on? Early morning. So your best watering before the heat of the day, I would say six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Water then so the plants are plumped up and ready to take on that heat of June you'll have better success, better swelling. The tomatoes won't crack or get real thick skinned. Your tomato, your squash will be juicier, softer, just better to water in the morning. I say that except for herbs. Herbs are better picked when they're dry. So I would say water <laughs> those late. In the, I'd say water. No, I guess water them all at the same time because they're intermixed. Pick them later, pick them later when it's hot in the day. <laughs> yeah. There'll be there's flavor. Scent comes out better. Mm -hmm. So may I have time for one more one question? One more question. All right. Tony would like to know, Tony. Uh, can he put in an Arizona cypress or Deodor cedar in a spot where he took out diseased Lelandi cypress? Uh, so Tony, yeah, yeah, you can. So Leland cypress has this, this canker that's taking out the, the cypress. Big green, it's like kind of 20 foot tall by 12 foot wide, thick hedgerow. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're going to lose every single one of them in the county. It's it's terrible. It's just terrible. We haven't sold that tree in over 10 years. Yeah. So we have seen some migration over to Arizona Cypress, mainly when they're really stressed out. But it, it's I've only seen one case. It's very rare. Never seen it on Deodor <coughs> Cedar. So Deodor Cedar, I would say if you're going to plant in the same spot, go with Deodor, Deodor Cedar, Cedar instead of Air. I'm kind of comfortable going both, but Tony specifically asked, mm -hmm. what's the better of the two? The better of the two in that particular case is deed or cedar. Yeah. I think you could plant Arizona cypress anywhere else in the yard you wanted would not migrate over at all. Mm -hmm. But in the same hole, it, yeah. it can come back from the soil. <clears throat> I just don't want to tempt it. You know, I want I want guaranteed success for Tony, not... I wonder if it will work, Tony. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of it. Yeah. All right, that's it for this show. Kind of this segment. Be right back with more after this. So I've had a surprising number 
of people wanting to move plants that, that have been in the yard for one, two, three, five, ten years. Natives, can I move them? Ken, can I? How do I move this? Is it the time? Can I do it? I thought I'd just cover that real quick for you. So you can move plants easily in the yard if it's been within the last two, maybe three years. After that, they start to get a really large root structure where you're really severing some roots. But before that, they're still young. And so the, the root hairs are still fine. They got these, these real fine root hairs. They're, they're white. They break easily. You can sever them or root prune them very easily. So you could get underneath that, lift it, and move it to another part of the yard super pretty easily. Let me give you some insider tips, though. The biggest mistake I find folks make is they dig the plant up first, they take it to the new hole, and then they process and dig the new hole. The plant is now being exposed to sun. It gets sunburned. The leaves, more damage is done. You should really do it in reverse. You should have the new hole where you want it to go. You should have that dug first. Get, the, get everything prepped. Have the mulch added to the native soil. Dig out some of those rocks, the, the chunky stuff that's not good for the new planting. Uh, have your root and grow ready. Have the fertilizers ready. Have everything ready to go. So when you lift up this new plant, you put it in your wheelbarrow or your, or your piece of plastic, your tarp, however you're going to move that thing over to its new site so that it's exposed to the air and sun as short a time as possible critical, especially as we dry. So it's going to get dry already. We haven't seen rain or any kind of moisture for the next, for like two, three weeks. And so it's been cloudy, but it has been dry. And it's only going to get drier until the monsoons come. So you really, plants can, those fine root hairs, they're very tiny, very white. They're almost, they don't have any bark on them. They're just exposed. And so if you even pull it out for just 15, 20 minutes, you can lose more of those roots than you otherwise would have. So dig it up and move it quickly, like feel the angst, feel the rush to get it to its new home. Set it, get it ready. Now, when you're moving a plant, this probably goes for just if you're buying a new maple tree or new aspen here at the garden center, you've got a, a root ball that's defined. It's probably the same technique as it is for something that you're moving or a native First of all, let me get rid of the native myth. Natives don't transplant. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna new, you're gonna lose them nine out of ten times, if not more. So they put on this great big tap root that goes down about 18 inches, and then it hooks a right and then just runs along the ground. And so I call it the big hockey stick. So very large junipers, very large, I mean, big established plants, a tap root and runs off. And so you can never get enough of the roots underneath that to make it successful. So you'll even with a big backhoe or something, you'll see them move them. And about nine months later, they're dead to the plant, maybe one in 10 lifts. So probably not worth it. If it's over two or three years in the ground or a, more than just a whip, a little little thing in the yard, probably not worth the energy. Just buy a new one. Start, don't, don't frustrate yourself. Now, for no, things you, you're going to move that can be moved, smaller things, you can get the whole root ball. You can get the whole tap root. Get your hole ready in the new site. It needs to be about the same depth as the root ball, three times as wide. If you know the roots are going to go down about 18 inches and hook and just kind of go out just underneath the ground, dig a hole that way. Encourage it. All the soil that you dig out of that hole, you need to get rid of anything that's bigger than a golf ball. So dig that old roots, bricks, rocks. These things heat up in the summer. They, they just don't, they don't, they're too big. They can't hold water molecules around it. They're just too, too, they bake the roots more than they help it. Get rid of that stuff. Now, the, the roots are going to want to get through the soil and they're going to need some help. You need to change the structure of the soil. And you do that by adding compost or premium mulch. So we make a composted mulch and you add about 25%, maybe one shovel's mulch to three parts native soil, three shovels, three, blend that all together. That's what you're going to backfill around your new transplant. Pack it down so there's no, no air pockets, nowhere in, just pack it down. The bigger the man, the better. Just pack it in there. Water in really good. Get it to settle even more. When you're all done with that, sprinkle some all-purpose plant food. It's an organic food. 
that slowly breaks down over the next three months. That's what's going to get it to add more roots into the surrounding soil. So sprinkle some of that on. A lot of folks will, should I mix it in? Should I put it on top? It doesn't matter. Just get it on there at the recommended rate. Usually it looks salt and peppered when you're all done. You just want some nutrients for that new plant. Now, this tree or shrub or vine, whatever, is going to absolutely lose its mind or its roots. It goes into transplant shock. It's, it's, not, it's in a new place. It's not happy. It's going to have to settle and get used to it. We make a product called Root and Grow. It's a compost tea. We brew it up. And it looks like it looks like molasses. You add three tablespoons to a gallon of water, and you water it in with this at the very very end. And that's what's going to get it to settle. It's going to feed the. the it's going to work off the mulch. It's going to encourage those roots to go deeper, get started out into the roots into the surrounding soil faster, and it's going to get rid of transplant shock. So when you move it, have it ready ahead of time. Have mulch, food, and root and grow. Backfill it and then care for it. Water it about, I don't know, a couple times a week. Should take for you right after that. And that's how you transplant a tree in your yard. Be right back. And back in the studio, Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week just to share what a new perspective of gardening. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. So be you've been crazy busy. I can't believe the size of that truck you guys unloaded. <laughs> My goodness. Full semis of peppers yeah. and flowers and perennials and roses. And oh my goodness, there were plants everywhere. It's kind yeah. of fun to see. It was like Christmas for gardeners. It was so exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh. It is exciting. It is. But it's it's almost overwhelming when they all come off. But you find places for them. You get them all out and people start shopping and it's all good. It's all it's it's almost like gardeners are excited. Oh yeah. Because they know what day that that truck <laughs> is coming and they're they're almost shopping, they're almost in the way. Yeah. Shopping in the rack, trying to figure out what's annoying is they, they go, Do you have I'm going? I can't even see what's going on. <laughs> I have no idea what's yeah. here. Uh we'll know here in about by tomorrow morning. <laughs> so right. give us a little moment. Mm -hmm. And then you just sort it out and it all comes together. Yeah. You get it merchandised and away you go. Definitely, definitely. I think there's pent up demand this year because the winter was just so long and so cold that uh, people are out and they want pretty stuff. And they want to veggies. You know, I had a, I was at a radio <clears throat> interview um, for something and uh, Skylar Reeves is there. He owns a bunch of restaurants here in Prescott, mm -hmm. very famous chef. I mean, hardcore, I mean, business chef, mm -hmm. very good at what he does. He goes, again, I can't believe it. Iceberg lettuce went from like $18 a crate to 80. I can't Ooh. believe the cost is, oh my gosh. Wow. I mean, I don't think that's going down, Scholar, if you're looking at what's going on, but uh, <laughs> maybe here to stay. But I think that's what people are looking at going, you know what? I can grow $80 lettuce. I can grow my own <laughs> case of lettuce for right. five bucks and a package of seed. So we're seeing a bump. <laughs> yeah. People in, uh, wanting the home gardens again. Yeah. Definitely. I don't blame them. Right. So what do you got for us? Well, speaking of home gardens, yes. so I do have some new varieties of peppers and tomatoes coming in that I think are going to be great for the small gardener. Oh, good. So people who want to grow in containers or uh, smaller raised beds. So these are ones that are more dwarf varieties or bush varieties that people can grow and they're not going to be aft out. They're pruning and cutting back. And I mean, tomatoes are large, <laughs> so indeterminate. Mm -hmm. they're, they, they don't even know how big they're going to go. They just keep going. They're indeterminate. They just keep going and going. They get bigger than you and I. You're wondering, do I have a stake big enough? Should I winch this to the tree next to me? <laughs> uh, and then determinant, mm -hmm. they're, determ they're, they're preset. Right. And how big they're going to get. These are the determined varieties. Right. They're only going to get to a certain size and then start picking fruit, get ready. But they're the same size fruits. Mm -hmm. They're not, the plant is smaller, but the fruit <clears throat> is the same. same size. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So the first, so these are all, they call it their soup, <laughs> super dwarf series. Super uh, dwarf. <clears throat> so super dwarf Maori warrior okay. is the first one. So this one, a uh, sweet, juicy fruit. It's a good, it's a bigger fruit. Nice. Um, and it has kind of, it's yellow with some red swirls in it when you slice it. Um, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Losing my voice today. Have a sip of water. You're good. I'll cover <laughs> for us. Oh, thank you. Just keep talking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a, a, a really good one for if you like a little bit bigger tomato, uh, but don't want that great big plant. Yeah. So that's a good one. That was yellow with a red swirl in it, right? Inside. Inside. Yeah. I noticed yellow just over there is a sweeter tomato or not mm -hmm. sweeter. It has less acidity, right. whereas more red ones have a little bit more mm -hmm. acidity. Just, I don't, I don't know right. if there's science to it. Just over the years I've grown, mm -hmm. what I've noticed. I don't know. If you want one with a more medium sized fruit to it, the Sean's yellow dwarf Ooh. Uh, is, is just as sweet, just as juicy, but a smaller, more medium sized tomato to it. Like a softball or like a golf ball? <laughs> What's More, medium hmm, size? What's, well, bigger than a golf ball, but not as big as a baseball. Softball. That's in <laughs> between a softball and a. There you that go. Works. You want a baseball Thank size you. yellow fruit <laughs> that's sweet, melts in your mouth. What's it called again? Sean's, Sean's dwarf. Sean's yellow dwarf. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the thing I love about these, like you said before, the plants are smaller, but the fruit size is the same. On them. So the other one is, <clears throat> excuse me. Tasmanian chocolate. Ooh, I like the sound of that one. I want to swirl <laughs> in the garden center, just kind of swirl in the in the gardens. Whizz, Tasmanian <laughs> chocolate. So it's a medium sized one as well. The fruit is kind of a really dark, almost brick red type fruit. Um, very prolific producer. All of these actually were rated as very prolific yeah. producers on there, um, and it's kind of very got a very mild flavor to it. Um, so if those are some of the tomatoes that are new, and these are actually going to come in some bigger cachet pots. So oh, nice. The pots Perfect. Be bigger. So you could just grow in that pot even on a patio, <laughs> front deck, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an entrance. Right. Don't even, or you could transplant it. So we'll oh, take yeah. those because, you know, we own a garden center. I want <laughs> the big ones. I don't want to wait. Right. I want to talk about picking fresh tomatoes next week. Mm -hmm. We'll take that and just put it into the gardens like it is, like it's been growing there. It, we've planted yesterday, but it looks like it's been growing there for three months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can do that too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So those are some of the special tomatoes I thought were really cool. Plus we're getting a whole crop of oh, all of them. Early girl, better yeah. boy, champion, yeah. sweet 100s, a uh, bunch of different heirloom ones. So we're, we're going to have something for everybody when it comes to tomatoes. Um, and, but a couple of new peppers that are coming out. So these are also kind of more of a dwarf variety or compact variety. Um, and they call them pillar peppers. Hmm, interesting. So they're okay. a sweet pepper. There's a sweet red and a sweet yellow. <clears throat> and the um, they're again more compact, more dwarf, great in containers. The fruit actually forms closer to the main stem. Ah, perfect in um, windy areas. Right. That's great. Yeah, so if you've got Genius. a windy spot, they're not going to tip over or blow over because the fruit's more inside. Yeah. And they're a sweet pepper, um, but they should be really interesting to try. I too. want one of those because it sounds pretty because yeah. peppers are just beautiful, glossy green foliage. Mm -hmm. They go with petunias and oh, lobelias yeah. and geraniums. Mm -hmm. They're just pretty. And then they got pretty fruit you can pick and eat. Right. That's, that's like the best of all worlds. Yeah. So really cool ones to try. And there again, plus we're getting all our, you know, the better bells, the green jalapenos, bells, the jalapenos, the habaneros. Uh, you know, people in. are going to ask, do you have poblanos? We're, yes, yeah. we do have poblanos. Oh, good. Uh, you better grab them while you can because yes. those always run out fast. They do. Those. Lemongrass always runs out <laughs> fast. Pet <laughs> grass, cat mint always runs out fast. It does. But we have, we're getting in two big trucks, so we should have a good variety of a lot of Veggies and herbs nice. for quite a while. Good. Um, plus all the pretty stuff because yeah. you got to get a geranium. Uh, we got some wonderful one gallon marigolds, to, perfect companion plants with your tomatoes and your peppers. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of really cool stuff, little herbs coming in. <clears throat> I think we need to have people complain about pollinators yeah. coming in, pollinating their squash or peppers or mm -hmm. their tomatoes. And, and folks, you know what your grandparents did? They actually added some flowers around the edge <laughs> of the, the garden. So they attracted right. the bees and butterflies and moths, the pollinators, mm -hmm. into the garden. So they naturally upped right. the, the pollination. Mm -hmm. You can add butter. Mm -hmm. Pollinators love the color blues and yellows. Just get some yellow petunias, yellow or mm -hmm. blue. Get some blues or yellows. Yeah. You're going to have butterflies. You're going to have bees there. Mm -hmm. They're going to help you pollinate those 
and it's pretty. Right. So you can use these, we call them companion plants, mm -hmm. not just to keep bugs away, but to attract pollinators in to the gardens. Yeah. Right. right. So you had an article on companion plants for yeah. tomatoes. Yep. And I have all of those in. Nice. So there we go. If you read the article, if you didn't, you should check it out on companion it's, plants. It's on our tomatoes. blog. It's right there. It's watersgardencenter.com blog button at the very front. It's the top <laughs> article. I mean, you can't miss it. So if you're looking yeah. or just type into Google, I'm sure companion plants or tomatoes. And if you're in our search radius, they're going to make sure you get, you're going to get the info. Yeah. So it's, it's helpful. If not, come ask us. We have experts floating around mm -hmm. the floor that will walk you through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Lots of experts and lots of pretty stuff. You just got to come check it out. It is the planting season. It is time to put some stuff in. So Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners, be right back right after this. Thought I would go over some native plants, things that grow wild out in the mountains of Arizona. And so there are a series of them, and you can plant some of these. We've figured out how to grow these at a farm setting and be able to transplant those into your natural yard. The most famous of all of them would have to be red yucca. It's a, it's a yucca plant. It's got that spiky, almost grassy, not grassy look. It's got a spiky look, but it's not as spiky as agave. It's not, I guess it's not spiky. It's uniquely yucca. They do great here. So we've got tree forms of yucca. We call those Joshua trees. And we've got smaller forms of yucca, like brake light yucca. It's a, it's a dwarfed, little tiny yucca. It only gets up maybe a foot tall with bright, bright red flowers. Beautiful. Hummingbirds love them. To red yucca, the standard that started the whole yucca thing. There's lots of yuccas here. Um, red and yellow yuccas. So those get up about mm, just shy of knee high. They get pretty big with flowers that hover about just above waist high with bright red flowers, bright yellow flowers. Hummingbirds just love them. And so these are plants you can put out there and probably water them by hand, get them started, and then let them go. And let them go by themselves. It's going to take, This is the here's the problem people get into. They go, I'm going to go native plants. That way I'd never have to do anything with them. Well, that's true once they're established. But to take a two-gallon, let's say, uh, Ceanothus or, or Manzanita, uh, and then plant it in the yard, the roots are all within that bucket. You've got to get those out into the surrounding soil before it's hardy enough to go by itself. And so you want, that takes about two growing seasons. So you want to be more thorough, more get it ready, kind of nurse it along until it is mature enough to go by itself. I would say that's especially true for your bigger things like desert willow. That's a great big tree. Gets up 18 feet tall, kind of a vase shaped, beautiful pink flowers or, or burgundy flowers. Comes in a couple of colors. Again, hummingbirds love this thing. Uh, I would say Arizona cypress. It is a native. It's got the word Arizona in it. There's wild entire forests down, down towards uh, Kirkland, Baghdad, those areas. They're just wild you know they're going to do well, but they need to root out first. And that's going to take a couple seasons. So you need to get through this year and probably the next growing season, and then they can go by themselves. Here's what I do. I push my natives and so they grow fast because they're kind of slower. They're on the slower side of growing. So they're native. But if you juice them, you give them water and food, you can really get them to go pretty fast especially your bigger like spruce and, and uh, uh, cypress, cedars, deer cedars. Oh my gosh, these things are really fast. I'll push them. I'll fertilize them more. I'll water them more until they get up to size. And then I go, thank you. It's been a good ride. You guys are on your own. So I let them go. So, but I want them up to size first. Silverberry. This is the native plant. Uh, what's the native of that? Uh, Ellie Agnes is the Latin name of that. So silverberry. Um, is a evergreen shrub. I think it's the same similar size as a red-tipped photinia, but red-tipped photinia is not native. It's the one with that great big red growth to it. It's not a native. It grows fast. It's pretty hardy, but it gets mildew. Deer eat on it. Rabbits eat on it. It's, it's not going to be long-lived, whereas silverberry 
it's again, head high by as wide as your arms are, kind of thick all the way around, super leathery leaf, bright shiny leaves, fragrant flower, nothing eats it. It doesn't get any diseases. No bugs go after it. It's just, it's easy to grow. And once you get it up to size, never have to water it again. It's just, a, it's a bulletproof. So there's several native plants like that, but you've got to get the roots. The mistake people make, they throw them in and go, now go and thrive. And they never feed it or, or water. They go on that, that cruise to the Panama Canal for a month and a half and they come back and their native plants died. Hey, I thought these were native because they didn't have a chance to root. Your planting technique is similar to what I shared earlier. That's you really want to make sure that planting hole drain so native plants are really really sensitive to soggy wet soil heavy clays caliche layers they don't like that and so you want to make sure when you dig that hole where you want that new native have lots have a whole hedgerow of arizona cypress it'll be beautiful it'll block the wind it'll get rid of the neighbors it's a great screening plant but make sure that when you dig that hole it drains or perks and, and a quick test of that this is especially important for you folks out that coyote springs piquito valley all the way up to paul and that that big old valley just solid clay and caliche is just I, i'm surprised anything grows there but grass but there's some beautiful landscapes out there test the hole first dig it fill it up with water in the morning if you've got water still sitting there at the end of the day you've got a problem that's a bathtub not a planting hole so you'll want to dig what we call a chimney you want to etch out just a portion of that hole so till we get to the next soil band the next soil layer then all of a sudden the water starts to drain and goes through the different soil and there all of a sudden it starts to perk it starts to drain faster so now a plant will thrive in that quite well grow fast Another quick technique, too, that I found, this is, again, Lisa and I had our first house just out by Cody Springs, that area. It's back in the 90s when all the roads in Prescott Valley were dirt. Uh, there weren't many houses. We were all on septic fields. Uh, they, they gave us water and power, and that was it. The rest was on you. It was, I missed those times, actually. I loved Prescott Valley back in the original days. Uh, so anyway, I digress. Uh, there... I actually had to rate, leave a portion of the root out of the ground, especially on the native stuff. Arizona cypress, my spruce, the evergreen things were really sensitive to over watering with a heavy clay soil. So I just started leaving about two, three inches of the root out of the ground. Then I was slightly feather. I'd, I'd mound the soil up to and just cover that root ball that had left out of the ground. It, it ensured that at least two, three inches of the root could breathe, no matter how the monsoon rains, no matter if the irrigation broke, no matter, it could breathe. And it dropped my mortality rate like that, just, just to nothing. And so that technique will work for you too, if you've got heavy clay soil, or you're just using natives a lot, they're so sensitive, don't dare try to plant a manzanita or a cacti out there, let's see a, a beautiful prickly pear, purple prickly pear, they're gorgeous, or, or a new uh, a choya cactus. You're gonna put that out there and, and, and it's gonna have heavy clay soil, it will not be happy. It'll turn yellow, so it'll start to lose pads. You'll wonder what's going on. It's just, it's not thriving in that heavy, thick soil. So it's a technique that can, and, and no one will see that mound except you from, from a distance. It just, it's just very slight. Put your water water basin around the outside of that or put your dripper on top of the mound and guaranteed you'll have better success. But when you plant them, they are, don't just chuck them in the ground. Make sure the hole perks. Make sure you've got all the chunky rocks and debris out of there. It wants smaller particles for its around its roots. It is going to want some composted material. So you want to Add some mulch or composted mulch around that into your soil. It does, it attracts the worms. It keeps the soil from compacting right back down on it so the roots can get through faster, better. Uh, fertilize everything, no matter, even a cactus. Fertilize a little bit of, of all-purpose plant food around that. It's going to be a game changer as far as getting to grow fast, fill in, get your roots out faster, and then water everything in. If you're gardening now, you should get a gallon size. I just took a gallon of root and grow home with me. It's for transplant shock. It's a great fertilizer for houseplants, containers, but really what it's designed for, 
when that plant is in that new home, it just, it doesn't know what to do. Should I root? Should I die? I'm just not sure. Trying to figure it out. It helps it just kind of, here, let me just caress your roots with some compost tea. And just, why don't you sit there and just think about it for a minute and then root, just start rooting. It's all about the roots when you first get out there. So you can put natives in. We've got lots of bear grass, that's wild grass out in, in uh, Presque Valley. Beautiful white flower. All of the yuccas, uh, a lot of the ceanothus, a lot of the perennials, uh, galardias, beautiful, salvia, autumn sage, this red flower, just the hummingbirds love. All those native plants are beautiful right now in bloom and can go in the ground. Be right back after this. So I've had two gardeners hit me this week. I'm trying to help them garden, kind of get things planted right and going and, and make sure their tomatoes and their peppers and their lettuce are growing efficiently. Their, their fruit trees are blooming and setting tremendously size, I mean, just putting nice peaches on, lots of cherries. And so this theme keeps coming up. Well, I don't know that I need fertilizer. You know, I put coffee grounds or eggshells or both around my gardens. That should be enough. I beg to differ. I know the internet poisons gardeners. I mean, just with the, you do a search on, on something that, that you're overwhelmed with content that is totally wrong. So you got to be careful or curate what you're listening to. And that's why you're tuned into here. This is just, we're trying to help you get it straight. Now, coffee grounds, let's start with that. Coffee grounds are not bad for your gardens, but they aren't good either. They can only help, but it takes so long. What they really do, they make your soil a little bit more acidic, only for a bit. Uh, it doesn't really add organic material. It doesn't have nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, all the stuff that plants need to form fruits, foliage. That kind of, it just lowers the pH. It does keep the sun off a little bit. keeps it from sunburning. keeps the, I mean, it might feed a worm for a moment, but not very much. Really, it's, it's good, but it doesn't do anything for your gardens. It's just not bad. So more the merrier. Uh, add it to your compost. It's going to be great. But I don't think your, your plants are, are appreciating coffee as much as you are in the morning. Now for eggshells. Great again. They do really good. Uh, you, you're probably going to compost those or, or chew them up or break them up or put them in a blender or try to get finer particles before you put it around your plants. The problem with eggshells are they're really hard. And so really you're putting them in the ground this year for next year's garden. It takes that long for the microbes and the worms to break all that material down. Yeah, but can I, I really grind them up well? It doesn't matter. It's going to take a while. It's basically one, but I don't know that it helps you that much uh, unless you put it directly where the roots can maybe grow right through it, but just add a few eggs. You can't get enough. I mean, uh, uh, bone meal. You can get an entire bag of bone meal, which is basically crushed up. It's, it's ground up chicken bone. That's what it is. That's what's in bone meal. So it's steam sterilized. It's really, it's good stuff. Even that you're putting down for next year's gardens. It just takes so long to break down. Uh, so if you're doing bone meal, sprinkle it right directly underneath your tomato plants. So the roots have to grow through it. So they have to pick up some of it. But as you till it in and turn in next year, it's going to just be there again. So there's a long-term effect for bone meal or for eggshells. Again, it does nothing but good, but folks expect too much good this year from just a few eggshells. I think that's a problem for folks. And if you're wondering why you struggle, is because you're just guarding in, in, in your food or your, your ground additives are basically coffee grounds and eggshells, and that just is not enough. Get a bag of manure to go with it. Get a bag of bone meal to go with it. Get some actual organic plant food, like vegetable and fruit food, some, some actual fruit tree food for your fruit trees, not just eggshells. It'll make a difference, trust me. All right, so that's it for the show. Uh, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week, and we love talking to fans of the show. Thank <music> you.